So about nine months ago, I made a video that proclaimed that my next long-term review was going to be Nix OS. Now, like I said, that's been nine months ago. The original plan was to spend about three months reviewing Nix OS, do the review, move on, be happy. But like I said, nine months. That's quite a long time for a long-term review, at least for me. So we're going to do an actual long-term review this time, and we're finally at the point, or at least I'm finally at the point where I can present this to you guys, and I hope makes some sense, but we'll see. So NixOS is, let's just get it out of the way, a really good distribution. If you don't want to hear the specifics about it or the, my thoughts on it, you can just stop there, and that's probably good enough. But there's much more to it. So we're going to dive into that today. But before we do, if you'd leave a thumbs up on this video, I'd really appreciate it. It really helped the channel. So first off, I should start by saying that NixOS is a Linux distribution. There is a YouTube clip out there that I posted myself that is of me saying that NixOS isn't a Linux distro. Now, technically, if your definition of a Linux distro is simply it has the Linux kernel and some stuff on top of it, then that's absolutely true. You're right. NixOS is a Linux distro, but it's unlike every Linux distro that you've ever seen before. It does things in a different way. Primarily, we're talking about the NixOS configuration file, which we're going to talk a lot about in this video. So NixOS just does things differently. So that's why when I say NixOS isn't a Linux distribution, what I really mean is that it's not a traditional Linux distribution because it does things in a significantly different way than every other distro that you've probably ever tried. Another thing that makes it really different is that it is very entrenched in a programming language. And what I mean by that is that everything that you're going to do in terms of configuring this distro is done using a programming language called the Nix programming language. And it is a, it's not a hard language to learn, but if you're not interested in using a distribution that requires you to have knowledge of some kind of programming language, then NixOS probably isn't for you because you can't avoid using the programming language that goes alongside Nix. You just can't. Now, you can dip your toes into it. You don't have to go full-fledged programmer developer mode on it, but you are still going to have to interact with it in some ways if you want to install software, manage services, do things like that. You're going to have to know at least a little bit of the programming language that goes alongside of Nix. Otherwise, you won't be doing anything in Nix. So that's definitely something that you have to keep in mind. So let's go ahead then and talk about what makes NixOS special. And that's the configuration file. Now, I've joked in the past about the configuration file. Like, oh, Nix OS users think they're so cool because they have a config file. You know, and there's some truth to that because a lot of people do take a lot of pride in the fact that their NixOS config is awesome. And there's nothing wrong with that pride because it is kind of awesome. At first, at least, the NixOS configuration file makes you feel like a super nerd. Like It really does. So you do everything in NixOS in terms of configuration inside of a configuration file located in your Etsy directory. So you're even in root mode. So you're super nerding it into your Etsy file and you're messing around with this configuration file and you're doing things like managing your services there, managing your network there, installing DEs and window managers there, installing all of your programming stuff, or your, your apps and stuff there. Everything is configured in your configuration file. So you're going to spend a lot of time there and you're going to be coding basically in terms of like, because you're going to be using a coding language and you're going to feel like a nerd and it's going to feel cool. There are of course limitations to this idea. First off, not everyone wants to, you know, actually do their configuration in a configuration file. In fact, I'd say most people do not. Also, it does require you to learn some of that programming language. Like if you, for example, decide you wanted to go use DWM, you're not going to be able to use DWM without learning some C. It's just impossible to do. You have to learn some C. Now, you don't have to get, you don't have to delve deep into C. You don't have to know the jargon or whatever, but you do eventually, if you want to do any configuration of DWM past what comes out of the box, uh, even really before you install it, you're going to have to learn some C. So you have to learn some C if you're going to do DWM. Same thing with like Qtile. You have to use, learn Python or you have to learn, learn some Python. 
NixOS is the same way. If you want to do any configuration, you're going to have to learn some of the programming language that goes along with it. Now, another reason why the NixOS configuration file is so cool isn't just because it allows you to be super nerd, but it also allows you to have reproducibility. You can take that configuration file and either reinstall your existing system with it, and you, you kind of start off with a fresh distro, but with all your apps, all your services, all your users, all set up just by running one command. That's really cool. But you can also take that configuration file, put it on another computer with NixOS on it, run that one command, and you have an exact replica, minus some versioning stuff probably, depending on what branch of NixOS you're on. And you have you know your system on multiple computers. They're basically the same, and it's awesome, right? That's truly powerful if you have multiple computers even if you're not like running like a fleet of computers being able to have the exact same setup on two of your computers is really nice now my problem with the NixOS configuration file is that it does get tedious after a while. So I'm actually going to show you right now my NixOS configuration file if I can. So this is my NixOS config and as you can see it does a whole bunch of different stuff here right so we're managing the time zone we're managing the internet internationalization settings we're enabling flakes we're installing plasma and sddm and making sure we have the wayland session available to it we're defining the keyboard layout all this stuff in traditional linux all this stuff would be done elsewhere right it's either in the command line or in the system settings or whatever in NixOS, all that stuff is done in the configuration file. Now, I mentioned where I thought that this got a little tedious. Now, the standard system settings isn't bad because you're only going to ever do that stuff once. And most of this stuff is just default from the installer. Like the only thing I've added here is the flakes stuff, which is ex experimental. We'll talk about flakes here in a minute and the stuff to enable Plasma 6. That's basically all that I've done in terms of this section here but you still are going to be messing around with this quite a lot and that's going to be in this section down here which is the environment.system packages section this is where you install your packages now the reason why it's i call this tedious is because when you want to install new packages let's say i mean this isn't going to be tedious for everyone because most people just install their packages and then they're done with it and that's not too bad but let's say you install or try a lot of applications you're going to have to know what that package is called it's not always going to be called what you think it's going to be called. And you're going to have to know if you're going to need any dependencies to go along with it. Like not, not like small dependencies. Most of those things are going to be included with the package. But things like Vivaldi here does require the FFmpeg codex, right? So you're going to need to know the name of the package name of both of those things. And in order to do that, you have to go to your browser and go to this website here. And let's say you wanted to install NeoFetch. Like so, it's going to show you NeoFetch. And then you go here and you click NixOS configuration file, and this tells you exactly what you need to put in your configuration file. Now, most things are just going to have the name of what you want to do, but some things are going to be named differently. If you've ever used Linux before, you know that every distro names things slightly differently. NixOS does tend to not name things weirdly, like Arch and OpenSUSE do, but still, you still have to come here and check, and that means that you have to always come here to check what the package is called if the package even exists now you can search for this in the terminal i believe but i'm not actually sure how to do that but even then you still would have to be inside of the terminal to go do that then come back to your configuration file put that name here save this file then rebuild your system and that gets tedious if you install a ton of programs now i haven't I, i've toned this down a little bit to just the bare minimum and that's worked out okay because i don't go through and i don't try a lot of different software packages here on Nix. I just do the things that I absolutely need to do and then I'm done. And I think that if that's the way that you use it, it's going to be fine. But if you install or try a lot of packages, that can get really tedious. Another thing that really bugs me about the configuration file is that there are multiple ways of doing things. Now, if you are any if you have any knowledge of programming language whatsoever, you'll know that every programming language just has multiple ways of doing things. You can set variables in three different ways. You can do if statements in multiple different ways. You can do case statements, all these. And that, that's true of basically every programming language, all the way from Bash to Haskell. Absolutely the truth, right? And the NixOS programming language, or the Nix program, programming language, is exactly the same. There are multiple ways of doing things in every situation. So... This way of installing packages is not the only way of doing it. You can do multiple different ways. There's multiple different syntaxes that you could use, right? This way, this here, 
this right here of it me installing fonts there's multiple different ways of installing fonts this isn't actually even the best way to do it because when i rebuild the system it tells me that this way is actually depreciated and i didn't know that to go in because in the documentation which we'll talk about more later is you know there's multiple different ways in the documentation to do this and at first this really bugged me because it doesn't feel user friendly right because that's just multiple different ways of doing things just makes things confusing but if you think about it, it on a regular linux distro there are at least three ways of installing fonts in a traditional way this is just the same way the same thing in a configuration file so it's not unusual but it definitely takes away some of the user friendliness of it having multiple different ways of doing something in different syntaxes in a programming language when you may not be familiar with programming languages at all can lead to some problems so those are my issues with the configuration file overall it was good and allowed me to be super nerd for a little while i don't think that i prefer this way of configuration configuring my distro but it's still kind of cool right and it was really nice to be able to take this put it on my laptop and have the exact same system right that was really neat it's not something that you can do easily with other distributions so let's talk a little bit more about software before we move on away from the configuration file this site here will tell you that they have a hundred thousand packages and in terms of software availability nixos has been fantastic like really really good almost every other distro that i've ever used there's something that i haven't been able to get you know you know, either i have to install Flatpak in order to get it or snap or i have to use you know pip or something like that i haven't had that problem one single time using nixos the amount of packages they have in their standard repository is really good and when i say standard repository you get access to all of this without having to do any funky stuff right whereas with like arch they have a really big repository but a lot of their stuff that they have quote unquote have is in the aur now the aur is awesome but you have to do something special to do it you have to use a different package manager an aur helper in order to get there and there are risks associated with it this is just one repository even on my beloved open not everything is in the main repository right you have to deal with the open build service or in pac-man or whatever you want to you know you do in order to get all the stuff that you might want and that makes things messy with nix it's one repository it's usually one line of code that you have to put in your configuration file in order to install something and that's really good i really enjoyed that part of it and it just made it feel like a more cohesive experience because you know you don't have to go hunting for a package if you can go to this website and search for something and it's not there then nixos doesn't have it you don't have to worry about it being in another repository where you could might be able to get it if you got to add this thing right it's not a mess it's all in one place it's really nice now there is another way of installing software but I never used it much because it's not permanent. So Nick shells are basically, you can think of them as virtual environments for like Python or something like that. You can basically get into your terminal, create a Nick shell that has access to certain programs. And that shell exists for as long as your session is open. That means that it is more of a development tool. So you can develop with certain applications available to you. But once you close that session, the packages that you installed during that session are gone. You don't have access to them anymore. The only way to permanently install programs is through your configuration file or through Flex, which again, we'll talk about later. So the Nix shell thing is not something that I spent a lot of time with. If I just needed something just quick and I didn't think I ever, I needed it permanently, I would install it through a Nix shell. But overall, this is the way that I installed software. Okay, so the next thing I need to talk about is Flakes. Now, one of the reasons why this review took so long was because Flakes are really effing confusing, and I'm still not sure that I have them 100% right. But let me try to explain to you what a Flake is. And the reason why I have Zany OS here up on the screen is because this is the thing that I put on a pedestal to explain what Flakes can do. Now, we're going to take a look at two different Flakes here. We're going to take a look at Tyler's Flake, flake which is here in this Flake that Nick's file. And basically what this do, flakes do is the same thing as a configuration file on Nix does. There, It's actually a replacement for your configuration file. Now, the simplest way to put that in a, in a more cohesive statement is that the flake is an alternative to the configuration file on Nix. It's a more powerful way of configuring your system. It allows you to pull in packages not only from the Nix repositories, but from places like GitHub and GitLab as well. You can then refer to flakes between each other if you want to do that you can 
basically use this in any way you want to do it. And that's one of the reasons why, why I have such a hard time explaining this, because there's so much you can do with Flakes, all the way from configuring your entire system to creating just a small development environment. You can do a ton of different stuff. Now, there are some things that you should know about Flakes. First off, like I said, it is a alternative to configuring your system. You would not use both the configuration file and Flakes at the same time, at least in normal circumstances, because you're probably going to use Flakes to configure your system. And if that's the case, you wouldn't need the configuration file. But also, the one of the main differences here is that it allows you to version control everything that the Flake pulls down. So every package in here is going to stay the exact same version no matter who's using the flake. So that means that you can pass this flake to someone else. They can replicate your system 100% right down to the version. And that means that it should work no matter what, because they're going to be using the exact same software that you do, including, right, I said, right down to the version. Now, on the regular configuration file, that's not version controlled at all. So that's the big difference here, right? So my biggest problem when it comes to flakes is that they're so hard to explain. If you ask five different NixOS users what a flake is, they're all going to tell you something different. And one of the reasons why that's true is because flakes can do so many different things. But the way that I'm gonna explain it to you to try to keep it as simple as possible is just that it is an alternative to configuring your system with more options and more flexibility. That's basically what's going on here. Now, if you were to go to and install ZanyOS, what would happen, because it's a flake, is you can download his repository, run his script, and it's going to execute this flake inside of NixOS. And it would give you his Hyperland, his Waybar, his NeoVim. Basically, his entire system would be installed on your system as a flake, and you'd just be able to use it, just like he does. You'd have an identical system to his system that he's created here. And that's really cool and it's very very powerful and it's very powerful just for him as well because he can reinstall this very very easily also it allows him to configure things in such a way where it's all in one place and that's again very very nice now this is the flake that zany has created let me go take you to a flake that i created now this is just a very simple tutorial flake that that someone walked me through I barely understand it as it is, but I created it myself, so I, there's a little bit of pride there. So every flake has two files, flake lock and flake.nix. The flake lock is basically a series of metadata that pins all of the dependencies of the flake to a certain version. So you're not going to mess around with it all that much unless you do an update, which you, you do through a command in the command line. But let's take a look at the flake.nix here and you guys can get a, an idea of the more simple version if i can spell of the flake right so basically it has a, a description the inputs is the source of the programs or repositories that you're going to want the flake to have access to and the outputs which is this section here is going to be what is outputted to the system for the system to use that's basically the standard structure of a flake that's, there's not much more to it, but you can pull in files and reference files so that you can have options and stuff for the flake to follow. You can also reference a configuration file for your system, similar to what Zany does, and that will configure your entire system. That's not done inside of this file, but in a configuration.nix file, similar to your regular configuration, but it's referenced by the flake, controlled by the flake, and you control the versions by the flake. So all of that is very confusing. I, I, at least I feel like it's very confusing, and I doubt I'm doing a very good job of explaining what that is. I, I will fully take credit. Even after nine months, I still don't know what flakes are well enough to explain them in such a simple way. That's just absolutely the case. You don't have to worry about flakes, though. I've been using NixOS now for nine months on a separate hard drive here and on my other computers, and I've never once used a flake. So you can use NixOS without flakes. I think that if you were going to delve into the Nix ecosystem, you would probably want to figure flakes out to the point where you could use them because they are such a powerful tool. For me personally, I got turned off by the fact that they were so hard to explain and, and understand. And one of the biggest problems is that while you can dip your toes into the Nix programming language and be perfectly happy inside of the Nix configuration file, you don't have to have a ton of coding skill to use that configuration file. You need some, but not a lot. 
That changes once you get into Flix. You have to know quite a bit of the programming language to actually make this thing powerful enough to make it make sense. Things like referencing other files, things like creating a let statement or an if statement, all the stuff you have to kind of know how to do and what it is and why you'd want to use it. And then by the time you get to that point, you're basically coding this thing. And that requires quite a bit of knowledge. And in order for you to want to have that knowledge, you kind of have to see others use the fl a flake and find out why it's powerful and all this stuff. So in the video description below, I'm going to give you uh, guys uh, at least a couple videos where people talk about what flakes are who do a much better job of explaining them than I ever will. And you should go watch those things because, like I said, they're much better than this nonsense that you just ex you just had to put through for the last 10 minutes. So go watch those. It'll do a better job of explaining what flakes are. So those are flakes. Uh, confusing, but very, very powerful. And don't get scared off by the experimental feature thing that some people will tell you about. It's been experimental for a long time, kind of like Gmail was in beta for 10 years. It's been around for a very long time. It's very well fleshed out. So... I don't know what their eventual plan is with flakes. Maybe flakes are going to be like the default going forward someday. I don't know, but don't get scared off by that. Okay, so the next thing that I have to talk about is Home Manager. And Home Manager, I have actually less experience with than flakes, which is, you know, saying something. And this isn't necessarily because Home Manager is bad. It's actually pretty cool, but I'll explain why I didn't really have any interest in using it. So Home Manager basically allows you to create a flake uh, from what I understand, of your home directory, specifically of your home directory configuration file. So things like your Hyperland configuration or your i3 or DWM or whatever, you can any configuration, any program that has configuration files, you can put inside of Home Manager. And then what that allows you to do through the magic of Flakes to have your entire system basically reproducible, not just NixOS. So you can reproduce NixOS very easily, but also reproduce all of your configuration files right alongside of it. That means that you can go through with one command after you have the files in place to completely rebuild your system in whatever way you want to do so. Another really cool thing about this is, is at least in theory, you could have multiple home manager setups and switch between them with just a command. All you'd have to do is change the files to suit. You just change one line of code pointing to the right path and then you should be able to switch back and forth very, very easily. That would be good if you had organizational issues where you wanted to keep things really, really separate. I'm not sure that it's actually that useful, but it's something that you definitely could do. Now, one of the reasons why I had no interest in using Home Manager was because I like to have full control over my configuration files. Now, Home Manager doesn't take away your control. It just moves things around and manages them for you. It's one of the reasons why I've never used a dot file manager before because I want to have control. If I'm going to have anything manage them, it's going to be me managing them so that if I make a mistake or if I delete something accidentally, that's my fault. I don't have to go blame a developer for messing something up, right? So that's the reason why I didn't want to mess around with Home Manager, even though it is really cool. And a lot of people really, really like it because you, you can either keep the syntax for your programs in their default form, or you can write a lot of that stuff in the Nix programming language if you delve deep into the programming language, and that makes it more integrated into the Nix system. That makes it harder to share with other people, but I can see the benefits of doing so if you're so entrenched in Nix where you feel like you're never going to leave. You can basically write everything in the Nix programming language, including the configuration files for other programs or other apps or DEs or window managers or whatever. And it, it kind of creates a cohesive ecosystem all using one language. And that can be very, very powerful if you're interested in learning the language. Not everybody is. So let me talk about documentation because the biggest problem that I had for the entire nine months is trying to figure out what any of this stuff means. And I'm still not sure that I'm, I've explained it right or at all, right? And one of the reasons why that's the case is because every single person out there who uses Nix explains this stuff in a different way. They use it in a different way. And the default documentation is not good. It's a very, it's, it's a mishmash of stuff. And whereas like the Gentoo handbook or the Arch Wiki or stuff like that is a very cohesive unit put together by a whole bunch of people, the NixOS Wiki, Sometimes it's okay. Most of the time, it is very sparse on information. But kind of like the Haskell handbook, it can tell you multiple different ways of doing things. So it's not always consistent. And those ways don't always work together. And sometimes there's not documentation for something at all. And 
a lot of times when it does explain something, it explains something in such a, a, a horribly technical way that it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The way they describe flakes, for example, has very little to do with configuring your system. They talk more about virtual environments and all that stuff, which is true about flakes, right? You can create a virtual environment with a flake, but it diminishes the power of it when you see other people do these amazing things when it talks about it doing just a small thing, right? And it's uh, it's a it's kind of a mess and it made it really hard to do this review because a lot of times I rely on the documentation to point me in the right direction. The things that are important are usually the things in the documentation. And while a lot of that stuff is still there, it's not best explained. It's so bad, of course, that the community has taken it upon themselves to write many different unofficial wikis for NixOS. The problem, of course, is that, like I said, everyone does NixOS in a certain different way. So you can be following one wiki and it has the information there. You can go find another wiki and it has the information there, but it's done in a slightly different way. It's not great, right? So I have some issues with the documentation and it doesn't make it easy to use NixOS because it does require documentation. Like you can use OpenSUSE without documentation because it's just Linux. If if you can't find how to do something through the, the OpenSUSE documentation, you can go follow the instructions from Fedora or Ubuntu. And while you might have to make some alterations based on package manager or whatever, the process for changing a user or adding a user is going to be the same on OpenSUSE as it is on, on Ubuntu or Fedora or Arch or whatever. On NixOS, because they do things so differently, you don't have the opportunity to go use the Arch Wiki to, to do something because a lot of times the stuff that you'd normally do in the command line is done through the configuration file in the Nix programming language. So that knowledge isn't transferable. And that, I think, is where we're going to kind of wrap this thing up for and try to kind of transition into my overall thoughts. NixOS isn't like any other Linux distribution out there. It's just absolutely not. And because that's true, it's not for regular people. It's not for people who know Linux and like the way Linux works. And that doesn't mean that some of those people can't transition over, but if you're familiar with the way Linux works, you know how to do those types of things like add a user, edit the sudoers file, all that stuff. And while some of that stuff goes into NixOS and is the same way, some a lot of the stuff isn't the same way, and that means that the knowledge isn't transferable and it means that you're going to have to basically have a learning curve to get here. And the biggest learning curve of all is learning that programming language. And while you, like I said, at the beginning, you don't have to go full on developer on the programming language and learn all of the nuance and context and whatever, you are going to learn some of it. It's guaranteed that you're going to have to because you can't avoid it. Now, if you're going to delve into Flakes and Home Manager, you're going to have to learn even more. And that's not something that the vast majority of people are going to want to do. And that's okay. That doesn't make NixOS bad. It doesn't make it unusable. It doesn't make it trash or garbage or any of that stuff. Eh? NixOS is a very good distribution. It's kind of like Gentoo. G Gentoo is also one of those distributions that's just not for everyone. And that's okay. You know, Linux from scratch, another one. You know, very few people have the patience or the time or effort to put into Gentoo or Linux from scratch. And that's perfectly fine. NixOS is exactly the same thing. It's super, super powerful. Flakes and Home Manager and the configuration file and, and all the stuff that goes into Nix is one of those things that, you know, if you know what you're doing, you can do some amazing things with it. You can put a lot of power behind your workflow. You can easily share that with other people who use Nix because all the reproducibility stuff is there. And it's amazing. But just because something is powerful doesn't necessarily make it something that I can recommend to everyone. And that's just the case with NixOS. Because of the big hurdle of that programming language, because of the complexity of, you know, Flakes and Home Manager and even the configuration file itself, and also because the documentation isn't really up to par, it makes it really hard to recommend to the regular everyday Linux user. And I'm not even talking about noobs. Like, I would never recommend this for a complete Linux noob. Absolutely not. I mean, if you're uber curious and an uber nerd, you could do it. I guess there's nothing saying you can't do it, but you're probably going to be much more comfortable on a traditional Linux distro. And 
one of the biggest things I have to say, and I've said it before in this very video, is that if you started on Nix and learned the way of doing Nix, and then like a year from now or a few months from now, you decided you weren't interested in Nix anymore, you'd have to go to a traditional Linux distro, and that's going to be basically learning things over again because they're going to be doing things in a different way. And that's just kind of the way that it is. So I would never recommend it for a, a regular Linux noob. For regular Linux people, it's really going to come down to your interest in learning the programming language and the interest in expanding your knowledge of that to leverage all of the power that NixOS gives you. Because if you're not interested in the programming language, you're not going to be able to leverage that power. It's just absolutely the way that it is. And that is where I fell down. Okay, well, two places. One, the complexity of the explanations of what this stuff is. Like, it really took me a long time to get that stuff in my brain. And even now, nine months later, I'm still at the point where I'm not sure I know anything about Nix OS. It's, it's, it's a weird feeling to use something for nine months and still feel like a complete and utter noob and not be able to explain this stuff very well. I understand that that Nix OS or that flake explanation that I had earlier wasn't very good. Like, I understand that. And it's one of the reasons why I've, I've shot this video four or five times now, because every time I do the flakes thing, I feel like it's subpar. And I feel that way again this time, but it's as best as I can make it. So that's one place I fell on. And the bigger one is just that I have really no interest in delving even further into the programming language. If I want to really learn flakes and really get into all those things, I'd have to put effort into the programming language, at least in some form or fashion, and I have no interest in doing that, despite how powerful and awesome that it seems to be. That's just not the way that I want to spend my time. Now, I have in the past done it with other things. Like, I, I delved into C because I really like DWM. I learned a lot of C. My problem with that is, though, that I, I can take that knowledge of C and put it into other places, right? I can go develop another program if I wanted to. You know, I could delve further into, like, the Linux kernel or whatever, because there are other things developed in C besides just DWM. NixOS, if you put a lot of effort into the NixOS programming language well yeah you i'm assuming theoretically you could use it to develop whatever program you wanted to because all the stuff is there as far as i know like i'm, I'm not a programmer so I'm, I'm not sure but i mean you probably could but chances are the only place you're ever going to experience the next programming language is inside of nix which means it's not also going to be able to tra be transferable to anything else you're not going to be able to find there's not other programs out there also written in nix that you can use that knowledge with it's just going to be there so you're investment of time is going to be just inside of Nix. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just going to be a personal decision. And for me, that wasn't something that I was looking for to do. Now, there's a comparison that needs to be made here uh, from a personal perspective. Using Nix reminded me a lot of using Emacs. Now, I know what you're thinking, Matt. Emacs and Nix aren't the same thing. One's a text editor and a Lisp interpreter. The other one is a, is a Linux distribution. They're not the same. But the feeling for me was the same because when I use Emacs, I feel like I'm not getting the full potential out of it because I have no interest in learning Lisp. I learned a little Lisp. I didn't have any interest in learning anymore, right? So basically what I do every time I use Emacs is I just use it like Vim. And that is a waste of Emacs because Emacs does so much more. You, it has an email client and a Git client and it can play games and it can do all this stuff because it's a Lisp interpreter. So it's basically a front end for an entire programming language. So that means you can do basically all this cool, awesome stuff, but I just use it as Vim. So I might as well just use Vim. I know Vim script. I'm learning Lua and, and I have all this experience with Vim. Therefore, I might as well just use Vim. If I, I, There's no sense in me using Emacs if I'm not going to leverage all the power. I have the same feeling with NixOS. Because I can use it, I know just enough Nix programming language to be dangerous, I can manage my system just fine, it's very, very stable, and it's really good, right? But there's this feeling, because I don't know enough to make use of Flakes and Home Manager or all the stuff that go along with it, that I'm not really getting all the juice out of the squeeze. And that's the same feeling I have with Emacs. So 
I have problems with NixOS, but they're me problems. Overall, it's a very, very good distro. It, and I didn't really talk about stability or gaming or that stuff because it's mostly fantastic. I had no problems with stability. It games just fine. And I didn't really have any issues that I wanted to point out. So I just didn't talk about those like I would traditionally in a regular Linux distro review. This one here is not a traditional Linux distro. Therefore, the review was a little bit different. So Overall, again, a very good distro, not for me, not for everyone, but if you're interested in putting in that effort to make NixOS really, really good, and you know, you learn that programming language so you can do all the stuff with Flakes and manage your system with a Flake and Home Manager and all that stuff, and you're willing to live in that ecosystem controlled by that programming language, you can do amazing things, but it's not for everyone, so. That's it for this video. I hope you guys were very entertained and that you found this worth the wait. So it has been nine months since I started this and it's finally done. So that's it for this one. If you have thoughts, you can leave those in the comment section below. If you're a NixOS user, let me have it because I'm sure that there are a lot of things I said in this video that were just wrong, but still complete and utter noob. So I just didn't know that to begin with. You can follow me on Mastodon or Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast, just like all of these fine people. Thanks to everybody who does support me on Patreon and YouTube. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel just would not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very, very much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, and all that stuff. And I'll see you 